Uh, and it comes as a result of a question as to just how much uh, soul winning should we do? How much talking for the Lord uh, should we do in our lifetime? Uh, and, or in the course of a week or in the course of a day? But before we do that, uh, we have been talking, of course, about uh, getting property and a new building. And people have all sorts of ideas about what a new building should be and the like. And, and uh, I have said, uh, having gone to seminars and these conferences and the like, I have said that there is a new movement afoot. And uh, the churches in our area, most of which teach absolutely false doctrine, some regarding salvation have massive, not sanctuaries, but theater auditoriums. One on the, the east side of, of town, they just advertised it on TV. Their youth group, which uh, who knows how many they've got, is doing a cowboy Christmas hoedown. And if you go in there, they, they have got um, a, a theater style arrangement with theater lighting and sound. Theater sound. It, it is loud. You can hear the voices wherever they are on that stage. Theater lighting. The organ and piano are missing in favor of a, I don't know, a mariachi band. I don't what it is. They got bongos and and um, all sorts of, of things up there. Uh, but that's where we're headed. And the three biggest churches in town and uh, are exactly that way. Now, the paper just had this. Audio adrenaline will get the new church pumping. The band that made Big House, now they're pr probably <laughs> saved out of the Big House as far as I'm concerned, the anthem of Christian youth groups will help inaugurate the brand new Big House at this church up north. And it's right across from where we're supposed to have a church. Audio Adrenaline, whose eclectic mix of rock, pop, rap, and garage band music. They're going to have that at that church there. And that's, that's what it is. Bunch of, bunch of, well, young men who don't know if they're men or women, who can't figure it out, uh, to follow those policies, and they're, they're incorporating worldly, carnal means. Note, note what it says. This will offer the, this church's first public concert in the church's new 2,000-seat worship center. 2,000 people. Here's what it says. The show, and I underscore that, show, bold in caps. It's a show. The show has been sold out for more than a month. Organizers are, are uh, say the money will go uh, for not only for the advertising, but for the sound and light production costs of what is going to be a high-energy concert. The tickets sold so fast, we, we didn't do any, uh, you know, big promotion, this, this guy saying. But the venue of the concert is the church's new high-tech worship center designed for a multitude of uses. And it goes on to say that from Sunday morning services to a noisy rock concert on Friday night. And we went in a church out there when the, when the board went out to look in the roundabout. And we went in and we saw some things on the side of this church. I mean, all the, the shades were drawn. It looked dark. And you had all of these uh, color uh, lights uh, and the rest of it. And, uh, and again, the piano and the organ gone. But we went in and had these things I'd never seen before. And I thought I'd, you know, grown up with it. We said, what in the world is this? And the lady who was there said, those are strobe lights. Come, come this this coming Wednesday night. They don't have Wednesday night prayer service, a Bible study. They have a Wednesday night rock concert. Come this Wednesday night, this place will be filled with young people, and they'll put those strobe lights on for, for worship. Okay? Now, this church offers theater seating with elevated rows of cushioned seats. You know, we've been trying to tell you, anything that's, uh, that is traditional is gone. It's absolutely gone. For the young urban professionals, if you want to even attract them toward your church, there is a certain standard that has to be met. Um, it is a stage with built-in flexibility, it says. The choir risers. You do not have a choir loft. That's old. You have choir risers so that if you want to sing, you just bring the risers in and you have the steps and the choir gets on the steps, they do their thing, and then off you go. Because you have to have the stage for the drama productions, the theater that, that is in there now. 
The choir risers, for example, can be used on Sunday morning, but they're mo mobile and easily moved on and off stage. That kind of flexibility is important because we're using it for, for uh, several different uh, things. This church wanted a facility to accommodate its growing congregation and ministries. And I would just like to ask the, the pastor and those people, where in the scripture are all of these ministries founded? Where, where do you get that? Would you please show me where the Word of God teaches anything but a, but a pastor flock, a shepherd flock, where, where one guy teaches the Word of God? Would, would you show me? Because I seem to be out in the cold on this thing. It's a well dug. Yeah, you got, you got all. But, but where do you teach? The, oh, no. Here's the key. You don't emphasize doctrine. Doctrine divides. Don't ever tell anybody that this is wrong because we're all right in this era of I'm okay, you're okay, peace at any price. We don't ever say, well, now wait one second, that's, that's the wrong gospel. Uh, that's the wrong apostle. That's the wrong, but you don't ever say that because that divides and Jesus Christ unites. I got news for them that study the word that find out differently. But here's what it says. They got this guy from California to, um, to design this. Miller's design fit the bill. His church structures are a departure from the past. Modern looking and multi-use, they have few of the visible uh, symbols of traditional church. And that's what we are, we are competing with. Uh, we, 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 have, we, know, we, we keep thinking that the old style, and uh, there's much of the old style, of course, that we're going to keep because that's uh, just the, the Bible. But you wonder why there are m multitudes going out to these various churches. Here is the reason why. And, and I'll read this, and we'll move on. Uh, this church hopes that this group was just the first of a series of big name Christian bands to play at the center in concerts open to the public. And it says, all these bands have found success in music with a spiritual message delivered in a worldly way. Spiritual message delivered in a worldly way. Let me ask you a question. Have those people compromised? Although, have those people backtracked? Have those people somehow missed what it's really all about? Having big name concerts to, to draw all this, and then you come and uh, you cannot teach the Word of God very long because people don't have the, the, uh, the attention span or the mentality or frame of reference to do so. And when you do it, well, it's over my head. But yet they, they go there in droves for one service a week. And then they use the, the, the other nights for the dramas and the productions and the, the, the big bands and, and uh, that sort of thing. And um, audio adrenaline has got my adrenaline going. It, it just infuriates me. Because that's what we're competing with. That kind of mentality. And the thing is... Our numbers seem to be dwindling, and their numbers, seem, you know, it's, it's overflow. They've got to go to several different, different services. But people will, will say, and I just uh, came from a meeting Friday. Some pastors called me up and said, would you meet with me? And these are grace pastors. I'm not going to give any names. But they were flat discouraged because, because they want to be faithful to the word. And yet they look out, and just like we do, and they see the, the faithful few, that, that, that uh, group there that that's, um, has a determination to stay with the message. But they see people come and go from, from their church because the other churches are, have the mentality of, of this church. And, and they, they say, we don't agree with it, but we can understand why pastors go that way. Why? Because they get their self-esteem... <laughs> from success. You know, you, you and I at our jobs want to have a measure of self-esteem and worth and value so that uh, once in a while uh, folks will say, well, that's a good job. And man, man, I learned something. Boy, this is uh, thank you for this, that, and the other, whatever, whatever profession. But, but when it comes to a being a grace pastor, it's always, except for the few now, now, I'm using that exception, but it is always 
You, you study to show yourself approved. Here it's worship to show yourself approved. But those people are thought of as successful pastors because they've got the numbers and, they, and, and the, the rest that goes along with it. And uh, those of us who try to stick with the word are always downplayed. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, you're one of those. Oh, yeah, well, what, what size is it? What kind of church building do you have? But look at us. Look how many people. Look how grandiose it is. Look how wonderful it is. I mean, all, all the, you know, young, they're young people and young couples and the rest. And I, I asked the question, are they flat compromising? And, and sometimes you j just wonder uh, 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 about our, ourselves. The, the constant struggle and the, um, the, lack, of, the lack of productivity. Uh, but uh, it's where the world is. They want a brief bit of, of spiritual truth packaged in a worldly means and that they can relate to. Okay, I, um, I have spoken. I'm, I'm using ivory soap this morning as a box and a platform on which to stand. But, but I just want to be known personally, just in case any of you might think of how great it is out there. I just want you to know my feelings with regard to it. They flat compromised, not just the, the Pauline message, but they flat compromised the, the principles of ministry. Now that's what we're going to talk about. Principles of ministry and people being responsible. Here is any person. The reason I say this is because oftentimes you'll read books or hear people say that we ought to be always evangelizing. Now, a lot of times the people who say that uh, mean uh, that in the context of when the opportunity arises. But usually they do not say that. And so we tend to read these things and say, always evangelizing, always evangelizing. Okay, well, I'm not doing that. I mean, after all, here we are meeting, studying the Word of God. And I'm not evangelizing. All of you out there are saved. And I have no intention of trying to get you saved again for the regular pastor's monthly report that we got so many professions of faith this week or this, this month. I'm not going to do it. Uh, anyway, uh, be that as it may, we're not evangelizing. Why are we wasting our time? Shouldn't we be evangelizing? Shouldn't we be talking to poor lost souls? I mean, after all, they have, they just don't know. And what we're going to do is go over some things that we've, that we've gone over before and take to the next level. That's called apperception. Doctrine is built on doctrine, and therefore, the, the repetitiveness is you lay the foundation and you go the next level. And the next, next level is simply this. I don't care who you are in this world or where you live, who your parents are, or, or what have you. You have heard the gospel. You have heard it, you understand it, you perceive your responsibility, and the fact that you do not hear a verbal proclamation of the gospel is because you don't want a verbal proclamation of the gospel. But by the time we are through with this, you're going to see that there's not a person who has ever lived that has not understood God's claims on their life clearly uh, and the like. So that if no one ever witnesses to them about Jesus Christ, they still know and they're still without excuse and, and they still are going to go to hell with full knowledge that they had an opportunity and rejected. And you say, Pastor, how in the world... Do you uh, do, do you know that? Well, first of all, in Romans chapter one, we go to verse number nineteen. And it says uh, there. Well, actually, well, let's let's back up. Uh, because it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. For there is the righteousness of God, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Okay, so you've got two things. Uh, righteousness. How do you spell it? Righteousness revealed. And if you uh, drop on down here, verse number 18, for the wrath of God is revealed. Okay, so on the other side, I'll just put wrath revealed. 
Now, the Apostle Paul is talking about the world. Now, what does the world know and understand? Clearly, without ever having had one Christian ever say a word to them. Two things. One, righteousness is revealed. They understand through the various arguments of the existence of God that righteousness is required of them if they're going to live with a perfect God. They understand it. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith, from dispensation to dispensation. And as a matter of fact, in history, every dispensation, the world has had it evangelized when it started. Paul said, I've gone to the world. And you just trace it on back. When every dispensation started, it started with a full knowledge of right, the righteousness of God revealed. Now, it also says the wrath of God is revealed. What's that mean? It means that the entire world understands wrath. The entire world. That's why they are incurably religious. That's why they're idolatrous and sacrificed to do what? Please their gods so that their gods will look favorably upon them and not give wrath and dire circumstances and down on your luck type, type deal. It's revealed. Every person who has ever lived. As a matter of fact, before you got saved, one of the reasons that you, you got saved is because you understood two things clearly. That to live with a righteous God, you had to be righteous. And the alternative was there if you didn't get right with him. His wrath is revealed. You understand it. Now, this comes down, therefore, to what's called uh, some of the arguments for God that man understands before he hears the gospel. Verse number um, 19, it says, That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Now, how did he show it? The cosmological uh, argument is one which says you go back from an effect to a cause. Now, unless you're an atheist and an evolutionist and try to explain it away, uh, you have to ask yourself, how did substance get here? Uh, scientific law demands that, that something must come from something. Uh, and if you have an effect here, then there, there had to be a cause. Uh, what is Smokey Bear? Well, I'm, I'm dating myself now. Does he, Smokey Bear still out there? What does he say? Only you can prevent forest fires. What is that? That's a cosmological argument for your existence or someone's existence. That if there is a forest fire, the effect, somebody had to ignite the thing. That's the arsonist. There's the cause. And if you're going to have material out there, then you have to have a cause for that material. Now, let me tell you something. Every person in this world knows and understands that. And that's exactly what, the, what these verses are, are saying. Let's go to John 1. Uh, we will uh, also uh, introduce here the teleological argument because some of these verses overlap. We don't want to keep going back and forth. John chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, was God. Therefore God created because all things were made by him, and without him the word was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, that's um, what we call here, we're going to introduce some of these other ones. The biological argument for the existence of God. Life, if it exists here, to life. Uh, so that if you have life, in him was life. Uh, and we're going to investigate this, that Jesus Christ has life in himself. And therefore, because he has life in himself, he can grant life to somebody else. And so my life can be traced back, not just to Adam, but to somebody who was his predecessor, God, who had eternal life. And therefore, in him was life. Now, guess what? Uh, even if you clone an individual, you have to have prior life to do so. Do you not? 
Absolutely. You have to have the cell from a pre-existing person to clone another person. And so biologically, every person understands, unless you are just about that, that much uh, higher than, uh, than the village idiot in your in, in intellect, you understand that life comes from life. Now, I realize that, you know, some 15, 16 year olds get in trouble and I say, we don't know where this baby came from. And the line uh, just showed up on the doorstep. The stork deposited it. Nonsense. Life, in order to exist, had to come from prior life. And that's what it says. In him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness. Now, that's the ontological argument of, of existence. So we'll be looking at all of these verses. Which means that there is an idea of God. Ontological is that of being. Every person that exists, if he comes to, to the, uh, the age of accountability, understands that there is a God out there. Where did they get that idea? We're all imperfect, to be sure. Where did we get the concept that there's a perfect being out there? Well, it came from God. Note, idea back to idea. And that's what it says here. In him was life, verse 4, and the life was the light of men. I exist, you exist, I've given you life. Now understand something. I do exist, and you exist, and the idea of my existence is another thing I've granted you. Every person can look out to the stars and the universe and see that there is an effect, matter, and it is to, to the cause. Every person uh, can look and see there is life there. It must go back to pre-existing life. Every person can look. I've got the idea that there is a sovereign God out there. Well, now, it's, unless somebody are, wants to argue with you, probably September 8th of this year, you'd have had a good lots of atheistic arguments, agnostics. No. On September 11th, the United States of America changed to God. God bless America. Now, where did they even get the idea? They were God rejectors prior to that time. It's because ontologically we all have the, the idea that there is a being out there known as God. And we understand it. In our lost state, we understand that. All these people saying God bless America are flat lost. And, and they don't know the gospel. They have rejected the gospel. But they know there's a God. All right, let's move on. The light shined in darkness. Here's the reason why people are lost. The darkness comprehended it not, refused to comprehend it. Uh, they could have known it, they saw it, they perceived it, but they rejected it. The ontological argument that there is a God out there. So Jesus Christ shined to them, having given them life and intellect, he shined to them. And that person, I don't care if they're a, the, a pygmy in darkest Africa, uh, uh, somebody living on the banks of the Amazon, or somebody that's your next door neighbor in the United States of America, they all understand it. And they understand it without you ever having told them they're lost, without you ever having told them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let's, let's move on here. I want to stay within our time. Verse 7, John was the same who came to bear witness of that light, that all men through the light might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, note verse 9, which lights every man that comes into the world. Every person has been lit. <laughs> you know, remember the song, baby, let me light your fire. Well, that has something that's not talking about this. But uh, I guarantee you, every person has been lit. Well, I, listen, we're, we, I just read to you, we're in the era of the relevant. I just made it relevant to those of us who lived in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> okay, uh, where am I? Not only did he give them life, but that life in it had intellect, and he gave them an understanding of his existence. But when they did, I don't want to. I don't want to perceive it. I reject it. Go on my own way. That's why people are lost, and it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with our witness to them. God has not left. I repeat, 
He has not left the flimsy, fallible, uh, uh, eternally important job of witnessing into the hands of clumsy, vacillating human beings. Now, having said that, we will address the fact that there is a part uh, where we're part of God's team in witnessing to these people, but that's a different story. The story is you get, you get these people who, who want to drive us toward constant evangelism because the world is lost and they're blinded and they don't know. And I keep coming back and reading verses like this. And I'm, where have you guys been? Sure they know. They know right well what exactly what they're doing doing. Uh, and, uh, and my telling them, it, just, it doesn't matter. They know they're, they're lost and, and undone. Now, uh, so let's um, go verse 10. He was in the world even. The world was made by him, but the world knew him not. All right. So let's uh, go from this point to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And in Isaiah chapter 40, it is, uh, starting with verse number 21. Have ye not known Israel? Have ye not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? That's the creation. Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? Now, I'm going to move over here to the teleological argument. He, he mentions two things. The beginning is the cosmological argument. When there was nothing and God made something. Cause and effect. But from the foundations of the earth, that's the, well, wrong color pen. Have to keep consistent here. From design to designer. And the foundation of the earth now, you go out in the universe and what do you see? You see a design. I mean, it's not often that you have planets colliding. We're all out there floating in space and there is order to our existence. Well, you ask, you say, you know, if you let things go, you know, if I go into my office and just flip things here and flip things there and never straighten them out, pretty soon that these are known as the laws of thermodynamics. Things tend to disarray and chaos. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be chaotic. Yeah, it, it doesn't work the other way around unless you've got a designer. Everything in its place and somebody who takes the responsibility to put it exactly there. Or be responsible to one <laughs> who wants it exactly there. But that again is a different story. Uh, Verse 22, sits upon the circle of the earth. He stretches out the heavens. He, he brings princes to nothing and, and on and on. But he's talking about, verse 25, to whom will you liken me or shall I be equal? The Holy One, lift your eyes on high. Behold who created these things, who brings out their host by number, calls them by name. For that he is strong in power, not one fails. Cosmological argument, cause and effect. I did this. Teleological ar argument. I designed it and it works for you. And it is a witness to every person. Uh, come back uh, to the book of Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Verse number 15. Paul said to them, Sirs, don't sacrifice to us. Don't do these things. We're men of like passions with you. It's Acts 14, 15. Preach that you turn from these vanities to the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. The cosmological argument. Verse number 17, the teleological argument. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good. Rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. That means that there's a design to the universe and that people, these idolaters understood. 
that there was a sovereign God that was making these things work together. And he, it, Paul said, he witnessed to you. Did you know that? He showed you beyond doubt. Now, uh, there's another place we could go, back to the book of Psalms. Psalms 19. Where it says... Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Note that. It's actually the word for preaches the gospel. Preaches a message. Night unto night showeth knowledge. This is the cosmological, teleological, ontological, biological. You just look at, at creation and all these things confront you what, with I'm, I'm a man, I'm temporary, um, and here is God, and he's permanent, and he is the one who made these things. Uh, there is no speech, says verse 3, nor language where their voice is not heard. Now, that brings together all of these things. Man knows, because God is witness to him, with a perfect witness, not from our frail lips, though there's a place for that. But from effect to cause, this person knows there's a God and I'm responsible. From design to designer, as a matter of fact, they look at their body. I mean, uh, our eyes weren't placed on the bottoms of our feet. <laughs> I guess that would help if it's there light to our path, we'd see where we were stepping. But uh, would you want your eyes there? No. Well, who was smart enough to place your eyes where they are? God. He put them in the right place. He knew what he was doing. The body is, is ingenious as to how it's made. But that comes from a designer. And they are, they are without excuse. They know it. Biologically. Uh, let's, let's turn to a verse of scripture here. John chapter 5. As we're going back to, the, to Romans and Corinthians. And we're almost done. But... John chapter 5. But we're, we're going to see what our job is in light of these facts. Yes, we have a job. We have a duty to witness. We have a duty to both, both um, in literature and verbally uh, and in life to live a, a witness to others. Absolutely. But if you feel guilty because somebody has driven you, well, they just don't know. And I say, nonsense. I'm going to witness because God has opened the door of opportunity to me, and I'm, and I'm going to witness. I'm not going, to, I'm not going to beat somebody over the head with it. If he doesn't want to, if you give him the word and he doesn't want to know, fine. I'll go on to the next person. Two, six billion people. I'll never live long enough to have all the opportunities I need to witness, you see. So it's uh, John chapter 6. Verse number 26, Jesus said, eh, am I in John, I want John 5, verse 26. See, I, I turned to the wrong page. Six, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. And that's the, the biological argument and then the ontological argument. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. And then we'll go to to Romans 2 for the next one and close on time. Reading on down here. Verse 17, it's Romans 1, verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, the world of men. What do they do when they know the righteousness of God and the wrath of God? They hold the truth in unrighteousness. In their heart, they change things. They excuse themselves. But God says, you're without excuse. These arguments are infallible arguments to every person given by God himself apart from any human instrumentality except that person's intellect itself. 
Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God showed it to them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. His eternal power, cosmological argument. Godhead, teleological argument. The cause and effect designed to his uh, designer so that they are without excuse. God gives every person that information. So, but when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That's the problem. Became vain in their imaginations. Verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. There, there's the biological argument, life to life. But they said, instead of going back to original life and worshiping it, I see the life around me and I'm going to worship that. And it tells it what they what they worshipped here in verse number three, uh, an image made like the corruptible man, birds, four footed beasts, and creeping things. I call it the doctrine of the four B's: bobs, birds, beasts, and bugs. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. So you go from cosmological, teleological, biological, uh, ontological. God showed it to them when they knew God. It's clearly understood uh, by the things that are made. All right, one more thing, chapter 2. Anthropological, or I just did that. Uh, actually, the argument is the moral argument. Uh, and that is from right back to someone who is right, who has taught us righteousness. The anthropological argument is the moral ar uh, argument. Could you go to a, to a snail and say, you ought, not, you ought not go across my sidewalk there and have all that slug slime to, to ruin my property. You know, I'm going to have to deal with this. You know, um, do you go to your favorite pet and say, time out. <laughs> You don't, why? They don't, they don't understand that. They have no moral conception. But when it comes to man, and this is what we're studying with the law. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law externally, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law to themselves. Why? Because there's a work of the law written in their hearts, and their conscience bears witness with this, and their thoughts either accuse them or excuse them. Excuse me, God! <laughs> You showed me all these things, but really, I don't care a thing about it. And they reject every infallible witness that there is. Every person comes to this conclusion. God himself sees to that. Uh, and so when we say, they just don't know, and, and you know, and you have, a, and I've been there and done that through the Baptist circles, where you have evangelists and they're crying and poor lost souls and all. Yes, that's true. People are lost and we should have compassion and we should weep te te prayer, uh, uh, tears over them and pray for them, of course. But when that guilt drives us to, to be a witness, you would think that's all we have to do is witness, 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 witness all the time. And that's not true. You must be ready to witness. Uh, if there's a door of opportunity, you must be ready to step in. But see, that, com that's a, that comes from a different, different story here. All right? Let's go to uh, just a couple, a couple of uh, verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, boy. On the one hand, you are an ambassador. Here is your responsibility to witness. Where it says here in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Okay? God, the Holy Spirit knows that there is a person who is now accepting these things. Conveyor belts of evangelism, conveyor belts of history, whatever you want to call it. When, when I was uh, approaching age 19, I was under conviction with these five things. It was just at that time when I knew there had to be something more and I wanted it. Whatever it could cost me, I wanted it. I wanted to know God. I knew he was out there. It was at that time, and I've told my testimony before, that all of a sudden this guy named Ronnie Borowski appeared in my life. Fantastic Christian. 
and he told me what I needed. I was a sinner and needed a savior, and I got saved. Prior to that, Ron had no influence in my life. But as soon as I came to the point of, I want to know God, God brought a person in my periphery that told me how to get saved. But Ronnie was ready, you see. He, as far as I, you know, I knew, had lived a life since he was a, a young person, faithful to church, wanting to, to do what, what's right. Uh, and he knew Paul's gospel. I didn't know much past that, but he knew enough how to lead me to the Lord. And when I was ready, there he was. But he was an ambassador standing in Christ's stead, uh, speaking for God who is in the third heaven to men on earth. And that's what an ambassador does. We're citizens of, of heaven. He was ready because of another thing. He was his own personal advocate. Now, this represents God to men. This represents self to God. And we keep on forgetting that these people are just as personally responsible for their own spiritual well-being as we are, or more so. I can't make them get saved. You see, that, that's the point, the law of volitional responsibility. But because I'm an advocate, I'm ready, spirit-filled, here I am at work, at play, wherever, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I know my stuff, and, uh, and I'm ready as an ambassador, and the door opens from one from another country, a foreigner, an alien. He, he crossed, he's a wetback, he crossed over, and no, no slurs intended, but he's crossed over, and he's, here he is before me. Or I sense that, uh, that there is this need. What do I do? Because I'm ready and know my stuff, I give out the word. You're a sinner and you need a savior. And I exercise my ambassadorship because all along I'm exercising my advocacy. Both are reality. Technically two sides of, of the same coin. In order to be an ambassador, you have to be an advocate. But you're more of an advocate than you are an ambassador in that if you're not ready yourself to lead others to Christ, you can't be a, a proper ambassador. Well, what does that mean? Just what we contend here at our church. Study to show yourself approved unto God. You know your stuff. All right. Now that comes. Uh, let's go to Romans 14 and we're done. Romans 14, last part of verse 10. And this is the advocacy. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee individually shall bow to me, every tongue individually shall confess to God. <laughs> You're going to spill the beans whether you want to or not. Tell me the truth. Oh, no. out it comes. So then, verse 15, uh, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, th therein is the secret then. Here we are down here, and here is this any person. And behind the scenes, we intelligently know that God has already worked in their life. If they've come to the age of accountability, I guarantee you they understand these five things. I guarantee you they do. But if they don't want it, I guarantee you that their foolish heart was darkened. They themselves did it. But God brings a person in our per periphery, and the entrance of thy word gives light, gives understanding to the simple. And any person who is unsaved, very definitely, is very, very simple. Uh, and so the advocate knows the knowledge. He transfers that over and begins acting as an ambassador. This person is ready, being led of the Lord. The door is open, and you give the word which gives light and just just like in my case, when I understood the claims uh, of Christ, um, I trusted him as Savior. Romans 10, and we're done. That's why Paul says this. We'll start, we're going to start five minutes later, I guess. Sorry about that, but <laughs> that's why Paul says, Verse 14, how shall they call on him that they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Okay, yeah, God says, you, I need ambassadors. We're laborers together with God. How shall they preach except they be sent? We're sent out of the Grace Commission. But they have not all, all obeyed the gospel. Who has believed our report? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. But know what Paul says in verse 18. 
It's going to hit you like a sledgehammer. But I say, have they not heard? <laughs> They've heard, but they haven't heard. What kind of double talk's this? Yea, verily, their sound went into the ends of the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. The Apostle Paul there has combined in those, those remarks the five arguments for the existence of God and says, they have heard. They might not have heard the, the pure gospel, but they have heard and understood. They are completely without ex excuse and thoroughly lost. But for those, uh, uh, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's where our ambassadorship comes in as doors of opportunity are opened and taken to, to witness uh, to this person.